Today I learned. Today I learned about the unifying cube rule theory that claims to settle not only the is a hot dog a sandwich question, but many other similar food debates. Okay, let's click on this link here. This leads us to cuberule.com, which tells us the cube rule of food identification. First, we asked, are hot dogs sandwiches? We've got the grilled cheese and Reuben and PB&J. They all look really happy. Yes, we're classic sandwiches. You know we're sandwiches. Hot dogs like, am I a sandwich? I don't know. New York said yes. Then the wars began. Okay, listen. The sandwich discourse is played out. We need to have a new discussion. Pop-tarts are a kind of ravioli. Um, excuse me, ravioli are a kind of pop-tart. The sandwich alignment chart try to bring order. Okay, let's let's look at this this little graph here. We've got the ingredient purist must have classic sandwich toppings, meat, cheese, lettuce, condiments, etc. And structure purist, sandwich must have a classic sandwich shape. Two pieces of bread, baked product, with toppings in between. So a hardline traditionalist will say, a BLT is a sandwich. No one is debating that. That is tr the traditional sandwich. I don't eat BLTs because that has bacon in it, so I'm not going to eat that. But um, ingredient neutral, that can contain a broader scope of savory ingredients. So you're structurally pure and the ingredients are neutral. A chip booty is a sandwich. Is a chip booty or chip buddy? I, I don't, I've never heard of this kind of sandwich. It looks like it's got cheese or chips in it. I, I don't know. Who eats this kind of sandwich? The ingredient rebel, they can contain literally any food products sandwiched together. So a structural purist ingredient rebel will say ice cream between waffles is a sandwich, which I guess it's an ice cream sandwich. So yeah, it's kind of traditional, but ice cream isn't usually in a sandwich. So that counts. Okay, now we're learning about structure neutral. The container must be on either side of the toppings, but not necessarily two separate pieces. So you'll say, a sub is a sandwich. Totally call that a sandwich. If you're true neutral, a hot dog is considered a sandwich. A hot dog isn't normal sandwich ingredients and a hot dog bun isn't typically a sandwich, but I, I would call it a sandwich. Structural neutral ingredient rebel an ice cream taco is a sandwich. I've never heard of an ice cream taco. That, that looks pretty tasty. I, I, want, I want an ice cream taco now. Now, the structure rebel can contain any food enveloped in any way by a containing food. So a structural rebel ingredient purist will say, a chicken wrap is a sandwich. Yeah, okay, so wraps are considered sandwiches. Structural rebel ingredient neutral a burrito is a sandwich. I mean, wraps and burritos are basically the same thing, but burritos are more Mexican, I guess, but... A radical sandwich anarchist, where the ingredients are sweet and untraditional and the structure is non-traditional. A Pop-Tart is a sandwich. I, I, don't, I don't know where you get that. I don't know if a Pop-Tart is considered a sandwich. But only chaos ensued. Then spake the holy prophet Phosphatide. Are you unsatisfied with current debates regarding what is or is not a sandwich? You should try using the cube rule for identifying what you're eating. Phosphatide blessed us with the grand unified theory of food identification. Behold, the cube rule of food for identifying dishes based on starch locations. Identify any food purely by the location of structural starch. That's, that's a funny way of calling bread. So first we have toast, where the structure is on the bottom. So toast, uh, popular examples count as pizza, nigiri sushi, pumpkin pie slice. Yeah, because the pie 
is on the bottom, the crust part, and then you've got the pumpkin pie stuff on top of it. So a pumpkin pie is a toast. I love pumpkin pie. I want pumpkin pie now, guys. Number two is a sandwich, where the starch is on the top and on the bottom is clearly a sandwich. Uh, by this definition, popular examples include lasagna, uh, that's a multi-decker sandwich, toast, which I guess is just hardened bread with stuff in between it, and quesadilla. Okay, that has the tortilla part on top and on the bottom with stuff in the middle, so yeah, quesadillas count as a sandwich. Now number three, we have the taco, where you've got stuff on the bottom and on the sides. Popular examples of a taco can be a hot dog. So a hot dog is not so much a sandwich as it is a taco. You've got a sub sandwich, uncut. So I guess you've got the bread in the middle and a slice of pie, like fruit pie. I don't know if that's apple pie or cherry pie or rhubarb pie, I don't know. It's a taco on its side basically. So yeah, if you held it in your hand on the side, a pie would be taco. Okay. Weird flex, but okay. Now, number four, we have sushi, where you have starch wrapping around all four sides, except for the back and the front. So popular examples include the falafel wrap, pigs in a blanket, and enchilada. I guess that's a uh, sushi. All right. Number five, we have quiche. A quiche that has, like, the bottom, I'm assuming, is covered and all four sides except for the top. So that's five out of six sides. So popular examples, cheesecake, soup in a bread bowl, falafel pita. There's a bonus round. There's three more examples. Deep dish pizza, salad in a bread bowl, and key lime pie. Uh, key lime pie is a quiche. Uh, okay. Uh, six, calzone. That's where all six sides are surrounding the inside. So a burrito is a calzone. A corn dog is a calzone. A pie that is whole and hasn't been cut yet is considered a calzone. I don't know how you would eat a pie by yourself. Uh, bonus round, there's also dumplings, pop-tarts, and uncrustables. Uh, I guess as soon as you bite into them, they're considered tacos until you eat all around them, or maybe they're considered sushi if you take two bites. Like, I don't, I don't know you, if, okay, whatever. Additional cube rulings. If it has zero sides, it is considered a salad. Steak, mashed potatoes, fried rice. I, I guess these are starches, but they, they're not surrounding anything. I mean, the fried rice, it's like tiny, tiny bits. There's also spaghetti, poutine, soup. Soup is a wet salad? What? <laughs> what? Okay, next, muffins or other blocks of starch are type 1 toast in raw, unsliced form. Oh, okay, muffins are toast? Rice? You are free to interpret the nature of rice however you wish. Okay, I don't think rice is anywhere on the sandwich spectrum, so I don't know why you'd bring it up. And vanilla soy latte is a three bean soup. Thank you. <laughs> now what does soup have to do with sandwiches? <laughs> okay, okay. Let's go back to the original Tumblr post where I found this. This puts the hot dog not in the sandwich category, but in the taco area. I mean, they're not wrong. That looks delicious. I want it. It also suggests pizza is a toast and an apple pie is a calzone. I guess? This suggests that cannoli and burritos are sushi. Open face sandwiches are toast. You heard it here, folks. Now I got this post from my friend Max out of 10 and he reblogged. Open faced sandwiches are toast. If it's not toasted, it's untoasted toast with shit on it. An open-faced sandwich will never be a real sandwich unless it's folded over itself. And so I said, wouldn't a single slice of bread sandwich folded over itself be classified as a taco then? Then my sister reblogs and says, Pasta is starchy and comes in many sizes and shapes. What does the chart say about them, hmm? And I say, 
don't think pasta counts as anything in this situation, sis. The Pasta is good for every situation! How dare you! Hey, I love pasta! It's one of my favorite things. I have nothing against it. It's simply a starch food that doesn't fit into any of the categories of sandwich. And that's one of the things that makes pasta so great. It defies categorization. <laughs> oh, unless we're talking about ravioli. Then it's totally a calzone. <laughs> and that is what I learned today. Thank you. Can you explain how crackers are made? First, the cracker batter baker bakes a cracker batter batch. Then the cracker batter mixer door will open and unlatch, so the batter mixer nozzle can descend onto the patch, where the cracker batter spreads out for the nozzle to attach. When the cracker mixer nozzle sprays the cracker batter spray, and the cracker batch emulsion lies a soaking in its haze, then the cracker batter mixer starts to stir up all the glaze that the final cracker stacker needs to lubricate the way. Once the cracker stacker handle stacks the cracker batter squares, then the cracker batter is hardened into double stacks of pairs. Now the cracker separator breaks the crackers in the stackers, so the wrappers on the stackers fit the finished stacking crackers. Then they're distributed to Walmart. I spent like 15 hours on this. This was ridiculously pleasing to read out loud. This is a legitimately fine poem. I say so with my BA in English and philosophy and my PhD. It's damn hard to write something like this. Be impressed, yo. Forty piece chicken McNuggets and a gallon of tea. Why are people even questioning obesity in America? Why is your tea liquidized? Where exactly do you live that the tea isn't liquid? England, where it is in a bag and you make it yourself. Like what do you do with already liquid tea? Microwave it? No, it's sweet tea. You drink it cold. Who drinks cold tea? Have you never had iced sweet tea before? So I reblogged this from a British person and I've been laughing at their tags for 600 years. Cold tea? America, what are you doing? Outrage! That's not how tea is done. England, you stole tea from China. You've had it a mere four centuries compared to their 30 plus. Don't play like you're some kind of authority. Skeletons ooing. Shots fired. World War T has officially begun. Into the harbor! England doesn't own anything. Except that time we owned most of the world. I used to rule the world, you know. Okay, Dad. If I stop reblocking this, I've gone to the other side. I have only seen this legendary post in screenshots, so today is a blessed day. Ha! Boston Tea Party Part 2! Holy hell, I found it! And this is why I love Tumblr. Drinking cold tea is like drinking cold and hot chocolate. Sure you can do it, but you really shouldn't. Behold, concerned Brit, chocolate milk. Behold the greatest Tumblr post! World War T is the best play on words I've heard in weeks. This post is a wild ride from start to finish. I haven't seen this since chocolate milk was added. Is that really just an American thing? You're missing out, guys! Cold tea, cold hot chocolate, aka chocolate milk, cold coffee. I mean, do y'all even know about cold water? Or is that an American thing too? You guys drink coffee cold as well? Does the rest of the world not use ice cubes? Do y'all not have freezers? What is going on? Just thought I'd put my two cents in this post. It's iced tea and not sweet tea. I don't know what Americans are smoking. I'm relatively new to Tumblr, but it seems like sort of a big deal that I found this post, so I'm gonna reblog. Imagine not liking iced tea. Actually, I'm gonna go drink some now. I don't even know what to say. I drink iced tea every day. Iced tea is brilliant, but hot tea is nice too. Behold, concerned Brit. Iced tea, southern sweet tea, World War tea situation. This post is a relic. 
Me seeing this for the 14th time in my 5 years on Tumblr, and seeing more notes and comments but still reblogging it since it's literally a World Heritage post. Yeah! You guys didn't know cold chocolate existed? I grew up with this shit. You guys didn't know cold chocolate existed? I grew up with this shit. Beep boop. I look for accidental haiku posts. Sometimes I mess up. Sipping chai. Fight. 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 Unsweetened tea. Gold peak. Real brewed tea. My feeling when I'm scrolling with this on my desk in front of me. Don't worry, it's a southern US thing. In the north, if you ask for iced tea, they look at you like you have two heads. Or they've heard about it before and laugh at you. Lamel. Also, I'd buy the OP meal to feed me and my two large male friends. Not to eat by myself. That's bullshit. <laughs> Ruthlessly necroing the hell out of this post. Why, you ask? Do Americans have cold tea, cold cocoa, cold coffee, and incredibly strong opinions about ice cubes? It's because people living in the UK have no conception of how hot it is here. Here, have a latitude comparison and a chart of hours of sunlight per year. If you lived here, you'd have strong opinions about ice cubes, air conditioning, and cold tea. When I lived up north, no house I lived in had central AC and nobody needed it. If you got hot, you opened a window. Down south, you literally fucking die without AC. That's why the heat waves in England killed people. They didn't have AC. And southern Americans all do. Because it's routinely too motherfucking hot to live! Yeah, that's the opposite problem. In reality, both sides have no idea what's happening to the other. Brits have no idea cold coffee, chocolate, tea and so on are a thing because it's bloody freezing there and no one in their right mind would drink something cold right as they're dying of hypothermia. Americans have no idea why temperatures like 90 Fahrenheit are so deadly in Europe because for most of them, temperatures regularly go beyond 100 degrees Fahrenheit and they're prepared to deal with it. They got AC pretty much everywhere and the aforementioned cold tea. Inversely, Brits have no idea why a relatively cold winter and temperatures going beyond minus 15 C were suddenly both for the Texan power grid and the people themselves. Because for them, that's just a pretty cold winter and they're prepared to deal with it. The problem is that very few people understand just how big the difference in latitude is for everyday life. Oh my god, I haven't seen this post this long before. <laughs> Can confirm, as a Brit, our weather sucks. It's always windy, never sunny or warm, always rainy and dreary. Legit, I remember going to Spain and just loving the sun. UK is just always a sad sight, no matter the time of day. Which one of you is going to tell me that tea tastes different if you put it in hot water? You, you were putting it in cold water? Radish? Answer the question, Radish! Yeah, I thought for like five years that people just put it in hot water to speed up the teaification process. Didn't realize there was an actual reason. You think I have the patience to boil water? What the fuck? You don't have the patience to microwave water for three minutes? Why are you putting it in the microwave to boil it? Do you think I have the patience to boil water on the stove? It takes less than a minute! Bestie, is your stovetop powered by the fucking sun? How long does it take you to boil a cup of water on the stove? Like seven minutes? Just stick the mug on top of the stove on medium heat and it boils in like two minutes. Less than that if you use a saucepan. Crying. You're putting the whole mug on the stove? On medium heat? Your stove is enchanted. Every single person in this post is a fucking lunatic. Yet another post that reads like four Shakespearean characters who comes out in the middle of the play to talk about something completely unrelated for comic relief. Enter Radishant, Mothman Masato, Boimkfrog, and Cats in Raincoats, stage left. They are having a heated discussion. Prithee, which one of you had planned to tell of different flavors gained by simple act of brewing tea with water hot, not cold? Egad, you poured the water cold? Wherefore? An answer from you, Radish, I must beg. Indeed I did, dear friends. Why does this shock? 
Without the guide of others, I assumed that heat was merely added for the sake of expediting this solution's brewing. Half a decade I have spent, or more, not questioning this worldview I had made. In fact, I am myself a bit surprised that you might think that I, your dearest friend, might have a patience of sufficient stock to wait until a pot of water boils. Three minutes over taxes patience so, the microwave will beep when it is done. My friend, this answer vexes me the more. Can it be true that thou dost boil by nuke? Are you in turn, my friend, so shocked to know that I have not the patience, like our root, to boil upon the stove our favored drink? It takes less than a minute. On what plate? Perhaps your dinner cooks atop the sun. How long can take your stove to fill the task of boiling but a single cup alone? In minutes? Yes. I counted seven, once. Perhaps you ought to have your timepiece checked. If on a middle heat you place the cup, you soon will have the scalding drink you crave. Two minutes in a mug upon the plate, or even less if you should have a pot. You cause me tears. Is this how thou dost live? You place upon the iron stove a mug, a mug ceramic, filled with water cold. How do these flames, though medium in height, not shatter like a glass this fragile thing. Surely then, your kitchen is bewitched with magics far beyond the mortal ken. The four realize they have wandered into the throne room. The royal court watches with fascination. Every single person in this group must be a fucking lunatic, it seems. I'm sorry, but the thought that has been put into this, I actually can't. The fact that nearly every line is so metrically considered, near-perfect iambic pentameter, with the occasional trouchy for emphasis, but usually retaining a strong sense of rhythm nonetheless. And then the king comes in at the end, so wound in his disbelief that his response is reduced to prose. And the even better thing about this is how easy it would have been to structure the king's line into iambic pentameter. It is effectively already said as such because of the way Wizardly Ghost has phrased it, yet they haven't. They did not break the line, rendering what, by all, typically of both Shakespearean canon and other periods context, should be the character with the most command and authority in the whole play. If there was ever a more effective way to convey a genuine, what the fuck, I know of it not. But it gets better. Shakespeare regularly uses meter in order to represent class divide. The nobility usually speak in iambic pentameter, save for a few particularly chosen moments, e.g. Lady Macbeth's descent into madness, Othello's realization of Desdemona's betrayal, or just lines where Shakespeare needs to suggest high emotion or when a character is lost in thought. Supernatural characters like the fairies in A Midsummer Night's Dream and the witches in Macbeth usually speak in trochaic tetrameter, an inversion of iambic pentameter. Lower class characters, particularly those used for comic relief, usually under the influence of alcohol, speak with no structure at all. Their language is plain prose. Therefore, if this is a conversation between these types of characters, as the prompt from Silver Garachi suggests, why the hell are these characters speaking so eloquently? Now this is Tumblr. It is subsequently logical to assume that this may have merely been a humorous recreation, and a very good one at that, of the Shakespearean style, in a way that is widely recognizable to an audience that may or may not have read a great deal of Shakespeare, which is understandable. However, logic is boring, so I'm going to probe further into this to the point where future historians will look to this as an example of overanalyzing. The inherent eloquence of the characters here suggests an unusual subversion of the roles typically assumed in Shakespearean comedy. This could be interpreted along two major avenues. Firstly, that the rhetoric displayed by the speakers is fundamentally representative of how truth can be expected even from the most seemingly pointless or ludicrous discussions. Furthermore, it would suggest that it matters not how well constructed your speeches are. If you talk bullshit, it's going to sound that way despite your attempts to hide it. This is similar but not identical to the second avenue of interpretation. There is the implication that the noblemen in the play are in fact the comic relief characters, therefore implying that the common people of the play are the ones whose influence, though not expressed in such a highly spoken manner, makes a lot more sense than whatever the hell this is. 
If this was a real Shakespeare play, I would call it a subtle exploration into the innate corruption of the rich and powerful. Well done, OP. Now, I doubt any of this is actually grounded analysis in any way, shape, or form, but if someone else can take this to the extremes of writing a Shakespearean scene, how can I not analyze it as such? And where else to do so than Tumblr? I'm in tears. I didn't think anyone would put this much analysis into this. Thank you so much. I also like that everyone else gets a version of their handle, and then Tumblr user Fidoop is promoted to king. Americans don't have proper cheese, Lamau. Like, what is this? Are you okay? Do they think we're only allowed to eat craft singles, or...? I go to the American grocery store and step into the cheese aisle, pondering which craft single I will buy. Everyone wants to act like Americans don't have cheese, but no one wants to talk about the cheese caves. The caves where we put all our cheese because we make too much, and our cringe government keeps bailing out our failed dairy farmers to keep the price of milk stable because the Great Depression. So now we have so much cheese in this country, we could literally stop producing cheese right now and still have enough cheese to give everyone in America a pound of it every day for four years. And I'm not even talking about craft singles pictured above. I'm talking about an actual, not cursed product. Real cheese, cheddar, brie, gouda, munster, swiss, you name it, we have a billion pounds of it. Literally. We have so much cheese that we're literally running out of places to put it. And in an effort to get rid of it, we reprocess a lot of it into craft singles. Hence it's a cheese product and not actual cheese. Cheese is but an ingredient in craft singles, much like how bread is itself an ingredient in German Graubrot. Although Graubrot is a food item that is actually meant to exist on this earth. And isn't the end product a cautionary tale on how not to stabilize a vital industry when your economy is collapsing. And for a very long time, we gave it away as part of certain food assistance programs. And that's not even counting the fancy imported shit from Europe. Because yes, even though we still have way too much cheese, we also still import it from Europe in addition to the too much cheese we already have. Tell us where the cheese caves are. I want good sharp cheddar. Get some Munster and Swiss. Get some other cheeses to try. Why not? The cheese caves are in Kansas City, Missouri, I believe. Though I'm not sure how guarded they may or may not be. Thought this was something you guys were making up to gaslight the Europeans, only to find out that the massive cheese caves are in fact real. Cheese Caves, Missouri. 40,000 square feet of Velveeta, buried deep within the earth. Deep under Springfield, Missouri, lies a cheese cave of industrial proportions. A 2 million square foot refrigerated warehouse called Springfield Underground. Kraft's massive underground cheese cave in Springfield. People also ask, can I visit the Missouri cheese caves? Do they still give out government cheese? Is cheese still stored in caves? Why is cheese kept in caves? What the fuck? Yeah, yeah, the cheese caves, we all know about them. <laughs> exercise. You are me. You are hungry. You want to make my world famous pancake recipe. This recipe needs four eggs. You have three eggs. Do you? A. Go to the store. Yes, you have a cold, but you could be in and out fast. Then again, you could run into someone you know. Embarrassing. B. Go across the street to your grandparents' house and ask to borrow an egg. You may or may not get a lecture about not being at church. Is it worth it? C. Use two of the raw eggs and two hard-boiled eggs. Surely this will work out fine. If you picked C, congratulations. You correctly picked my thought process. I have committed an affront to God and my tummy hurts so badly. Actually, oddly enough, the pancakes tasted fine despite all of the bits of whole egg falling out of them, which is where the affront to God kicks in. Anyway, if this ever happens again, I'm just gonna go to the store. Experiment failed. We'll get them next time. Now, I don't know much about cooking, but shouldn't cutting the recipe in half have been an option here? I didn't... I didn't even think to do that. No. No. Charlotte, what do you mean you didn't think of that? I didn't! Charlotte. Charlie. Chuck. I'm so sorry, but... 
The eggs are supposed to help bind it all together. Hard boiled eggs would do nothing. Anyway, the next time you're missing one egg, try a quarter cup applesauce or a quarter cup mashed banana. Or three tablespoons of mayonnaise if you use less oil. I could have used other ingredients? Oh my god, what is my life? Actually, you know what? In fairness to me, I've been on a lot of cold medicine this week while battling a virus. From now on, I'm only making sandwiches. I'm no longer on ungodly amounts of cold medicine. I wish I could tell you I have no memory of making this post, and by extension the pancakes, but unfortunately I do. The three egg solution comment alignment chart. Lawful good. Now, I don't know much about cooking, but shouldn't cutting the recipe in half have been an option here? Neutral good. I know someone suggested cutting the recipe in the future, but substituting with melted butter should work too. That's what I do for a thin pancake recipe I use. Glad it mostly worked out though. Chaotic good. The water that comes in canned chickpeas is a good egg substitute, by the way. Lawful neutral. Take a quarter off the other ingredients? True neutral. I chose option D. Don't make the pancakes today. Stunned option C came first. Chaotic neutral. Would have simply said fuck it and made it with the three eggs and used a little less of all the other ingredients. Baking is not an exact science. Lawful evil. I would have just braved grandma. Neutral evil. I just would have made it with one less egg. It would have probably been dry, but fine. You can largely either add too many or not enough eggs to recipes and have them be tolerable. Oftentimes I will add the three times the necessary amount of eggs to things when I'm baking by ear. It's fine, it's just like the world's heaviest muffins. Chaotic evil. You could have just used 65 grams of blood in place of the missing egg. You could replace raw eggs with fresh blood depending on availability. Who is using blood in place of eggs? You are evil! I think what's wrong with me is that my dad loved making boiled peanuts. But when you say boiled peanuts in a thick Mississippi Delta accent, it sounds like bald penis, and we were forbidden from acknowledging that. My dad, internally, the children must be fed nutriment. I have in my possession a very large pot and a propane burner. I shall make a sojourn to the grocers and procure peanuts. My dad allowed. Hey, y'all want some bald penis? All of us, internally. Ah, yes, such a delectable summertime treat that will be. All of us allowed. Hey, shit, yeah, daddy about to ball up some bald penis. Who the fuck eats peanuts boiled? They take on a delightful texture, similar to water chestnuts, and get infused with whatever seasonings you put in the water. It is literally so fucking delicious. And if you don't know about bald penis, then you are deprived the food of the gods. As a European, what the fuck? Honey, darling, listen to me. Would I lie to you? No, I wouldn't. If you ever find yourself driving around in the rural southern U.S., you simply must keep an eye out for one of these gentlemen. For a very reasonable price, you'll be provided a cup of absolutely delectable provincial delicacies that will surely equal any hors d'oeuvres you might find on the continent. I promise, darling, it is the most delicious dining experience you're likely to find. And it will surely, as my dear departed grandmama used to say, make your tongue slap your brains out. This gentleman has spelled peanuts three different ways on his stall. Boiled peanuts, hot boiled peanuts, hot boiled peanuts. As is the time-honored tradition of our people, yes. <laughs>